Hi everyone, Tim Grove here. I am super excited to announce that my new book, Star Spangled, The Story of a Flag, a Battle, and the American Anthem, is now available at booksellers everywhere. Hi everyone, Tim Grove here. I'm in the backyard of friends, just sitting here chatting about my new book, Star Spangled, The Story of a Flag, a Battle, and the American Anthem. Um, so I wanted to tell you just a little bit about what is in the book, and it's about roughly the year before the uh, Battle of Baltimore, which a lot of people don't know when that was, but it was 1814. Um, it was a British attack on Fort McHenry and Baltimore, the city, um, and it was part of the War of 1812, and which is very confusing because it happened in 1814. And the battle, the war actually ended in 1815, but it's still called the Battle of 1812, or War of 1812, so it's confusing. Um, so my book focuses on six main characters, four are, are American, two are British. I wanted to make sure to get the British perspective because we don't hear that very often. Everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people know Francis Scott Key. That's the person that people associate with the Star Spangled Banner. A lot of people learn in school that he penned the words to our national anthem, uh, which is very true. Um, he was, I'll start with him. So he was um, from Maryland. He lived in Georgetown, which was right next to Washington, D.C., the new capital city at this time. He was a lawyer. Um, when the war started in 1812, he was against the war. Some people in America were for the war, some people were against the war. Um, this was America's first war as a new country against Britain, which was a mighty superpower. They ruled the seas. Um, it was insane almost to go against Britain, but Madison declared war because he was tired of, the British were just abusing American trade and shipping and they were taking sold, forcing soldiers on their ships, oppressing, it was called oppressment. And um, that's why the war started. And um, so Key was not for the war, he was against it. And he had an interesting background. He grew up hearing stories because his dad had been a soldier in the Revolutionary War. And his uncle was also a soldier in the Revolutionary War, but his uncle fought for the British. He was a loyalist, which is very interesting. Um, his, his father, Francis Cucky's father, also fought with one of my other main characters. They knew each other in the Revolutionary War. So, uh, interesting connections at this time. So, anyway, um, Francis Scott Key found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time because eventually the war came closer to where he was and he decided, he read about everything the British were doing to um, pillage and terrorize his neighbors and so he decided he needed to get involved in the war and um, the, how he got involved in Baltimore is one of his friends named Dr. Beans who was a doctor in uh, Upper Marlboro uh, was captured by the British he was a private citizen and um, so he really shouldn't have been captured but uh, he did some things that really worked up the British and they didn't like it. So they captured him and, and took him back to their ships. And uh, they were trying, the Americans were trying to get him freed through different diplomatic channels. And at that time, you could go with, you could go visit the British leadership and make your request to get him freed. And that's what uh, Francis Scott Key did because his friends came to him and said, you are, he was very well known as an eloquent speaker and he had argued in front of the Supreme Court, so he was very well known as an orator. And so they thought if anyone could convince the British to release Ooh. Beans, it was Francis Scott Key. So he agreed to do it because he was a friend of Beans. Um, so he had to get permission from the President of the United States to go meet with the top British people. So he had to, they had to track down where the British ships were. They didn't know where they were in the, in the Chesapeake Bay. They didn't even know if they would find them, but they found them. And um, in the course of, in the course of, so they were immediately invited to lunch with the British, main British officers, because that was protocol of the day. It was extending 
uh, hospitality, I guess, because they were representatives of the American government. So um, they quickly, I shouldn't give it all away, and I won't, but uh, basically while he was there, he overheard their plans to attack Baltimore. And when he had secured the release of beans, he thought he would be on his way, and he was a very favorable outcome. He was happy that he had secured beans. So he said, well, we'll be on our way. And they said, oh no, you heard our plans. You know what's happening. You're staying with us. You're stuck as our prisoner until the battle happens. And so he was, he was stuck behind enemy lines, uh, forced to watch the whole naval attack happen. So that's why he was stuck, not where he wanted to be. So another character is Mary Pickersgill, and she, she was a 19th century businesswoman. She owned her own business as a flag maker in Baltimore. She was a widow, and she lived with her mother, who was a widow. She had one daughter. Um, she had been born in Philadelphia in 1776, and her mother was a flag maker in Philadelphia. So chances are they knew Betsy Ross. Um, Mary Pickersgill is someone no one has ever heard of, really. Her house is preserved and is open as a museum today in Baltimore called the Flag House. But she gets no credit. People just don't know who she is. Betsy Ross gets all the credit. And that's something I'm trying to change a little bit because there's no historical evidence that says that Betsy Ross really uh, sewed the first flag. Um, wow. She did meet with George Washington. But and she was a seamstress in Philadelphia and made flags. But there's the story of her making the first flag. It just can't be documented. Wow. So her house is restored. You can see that in Philadelphia. They think it's her house. But there's just a lot of question surrounding Betsy Ross. Um, so Mary Pickersgill, uh, the summer before, so we're talking about July, roughly July 1813, some representatives from Fort McHenry came to her shop and said, we have an order of, for two flags, large flags. The fort didn't have a, a flag. It wasn't the new fort, but it just didn't have a big flag. And um, it's not quite true to say that it was larger than other flags. It was standard size of a garrison flag. So there were two. A lot of people don't know there were two flags. One was smaller. It was called a garrison flag and a storm flag. Um, and so she had to decide whether she could do this in six weeks. They wanted it in six weeks and it was, her little house is very small and this flag was very large, about a quarter of the size of a basketball court. Wow. And um, she had to decide if she could get the materials and it took the skill of everyone in her house. So she had nieces living with her, a daughter, her mother, they were all seamstresses. She owned one slave and she had an indentured servant and they were probably all engaged in sewing this flag in the time it took. And they had to go to a brewery next door to complete it, spread out, because it was so large. And obviously there were no electric lights then, so they had to use candles, and there was the danger of fire. They were working into the night to sew this flag for this fort. She had no idea that her flag, and never did in her lifetime, know that her flag would become a national treasure via the Smithsonian. Wow. Or would inspire a national anthem. because mm -hmm. the because the national anthem only became our national anthem in 1931. So no one in this story even knew wow. it, this event would be the basis of our national anthem. Mm -hmm. So that's Mary Pickers Gill. Um, a third person was Samuel Smith. He was the guy that was that Francis Scott Key's father served with. Samuel Smith was lived a citizen mostly of Baltimore his whole life. He was a senator, but he also served in the Revolutionary War. Um, in many, many battles with Washington. Um, so he was just a really well-rounded person. He was a representative in Congress, but also pro, Senator, uh, pro tem, President Pro Tem of the Senate. Uh, so he was very uh, active as a politician. People in Baltimore trusted him. So when, when Washington was attacked in August of 1814, uh, the citizens, they knew there was a target on Baltimore uh, very early on because they were the third largest city in the country. But the other reason they had a target on them was because of their shipbuilding industry. And that's where the fourth character comes in, who is Thomas Kemp. And he owned a shipyard in Fells Point. That's where a lot of the shipyards were in Baltimore. He built some of the fastest ships. And these were ships that were called privateers. They had a letter of mark, which allowed them to attack British shipping and 
capture it and bring it back and sell the goods at their own profit. So they made a lot of money if, if they didn't get caught. I mean, it was a dangerous business being a privateer, but they were basically government sanctioned uh, pirates. And um, so he built the most famous ships that were well known throughout the country. And so I decided to include him as a character. He's never, he's pretty rare, no one ever has heard of him. But because he gets at the question of why Baltimore, why did the British call Baltimore a nest of pirates? They hated Baltimore because <laughs> it was doing so much financial damage. And there were being, privateers were being built other places as well around the country. But Baltimore was one of the, if not the main, hub of the privateering. And so it was great interest in the, on the British part to, to stop Baltimore, to burn it or do whatever. So, so after Washington was attacked, the citizens actually stood on their roofs from Washington, or in Baltimore, and could look at the horizon to Washington and see flames what? from Washington burning. And so they were a little scared. And so I think that same day or the next day, they said, well, who is going to be in charge of our defenses? They'd been working on defenses, so they weren't just starting from scratch. They had been, Smith, Samuel Smith is his name. He had been in charge of, of reinforcing Fort McHenry, of building earth, uh, a ring around Baltimore, protective defenses already. People had already started flocking in from Pennsylvania and Virginia to, to be in Baltimore to help protect them because there was very, Clear. people thought that they were going to be attacked. Mm -hmm. So it was very easy to decide who should be the person to help, Bal to lead the defenses of Baltimore, and that was Samuel Smith. Mm -hmm. So um, again, he's a person no one has ever really heard of. If you go to Federal Hill in Baltimore, there's a big statue of him. If you know where that is, it's right up from Inner Harbor. Mm -hmm. um, so Thomas Kemp's an interesting character because we don't know much about him. Uh, there's no image of him. There's an image of everyone else, but there's no image of Thomas Kemp. Uh, he was a Quaker, so I assumed he hadn't uh, been a slave owner, because a lot of Quakers weren't. He did own slaves, so all of my four American characters were slave owners, which surprised me. Um, so those are the four American characters, and then the two British characters are the guy that was in charge of everything was named uh, Admiral Alexander Cochrane, and he only came to, so he was stationed in Bermuda, but he was the head of the whole British uh, efforts in North America, and um, so he only came to the Chesapeake Bay, I think in July or August, 1814, so the Battle of Baltimore was early September, 1814, so he wasn't there that long. So before he came, there was a guy named um, George Coburn, Admiral George Coburn, and he was the, he was a guy that the American press called the Great Bandit, and he, he arrived in March 1813, so he had about a year, and he went around Chesapeake Bay terrorizing towns, burning people's homes. Um, basically, he was in charge of damaging American morale, just making Americans not want to fight the British. So they, he did whatever, I mean, he was, they were burning homes just at liberty, um, they assumed if you had a gun in your house, you were part of the militia. And of course, every man had a gun in the house because for hunting and so that was, your house was fodder for uh, a bonfire. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is some of the soldiers were burning, when they had to burn, were ordered to burn homes. Sometimes it was their relatives because some British soldiers had American relatives who were living there, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but Haver de Grace was attacked a lot of different towns. St. Michael's, you might know St. Michael's was attacked. Uh, a lot of different towns around the Chesapeake were, were just attacked. So he was not very well liked. And so both of these guys did not like Americans. And Cochran did not like Americans for several reasons. One is his brother had been killed in the Battle of Yorktown. His head was shot off by an American. So mm -hmm. another reason was that his, his in-laws he married a, a New York woman who was a lo from a Loyalist family, and so Loyalists were not treated that well after the Revolution, and so his in-laws had not been treated well, and so he didn't like Americans for that. And then also he had encountered slavery, um, 
firsthand in, I think, Norfolk, Virginia, and he had seen it and witnessed how horrible it was, and that was another reason he didn't like Americans. So he had some good reasons for not liking Americans. Mm -hmm. But his plan was not to attack Baltimore when he did. They were actually headed out. I mean, we all know what humid weather is like in Virginia in August, and the British were just sick of it and wanted to get away. They thought the cooler climate of the Atlantic, and they were headed for Rhode Island, actually. Um, however, he had started sending people to Rhode Island and then immediately got the report of, from the, the weather, his weather experts who said that the, uh, the tides in the bay were not uh, conducive to leaving the bay at that time. So they had to wait two weeks. And he thought, well, while we're here, and he had got some new intelligence about Baltimore being in chaos, and there was an American ship that he thought um, he heard was in Baltimore that they could destroy. And he just decided the tide might be in favor to get closer to the fort in Baltimore because the Patapsco River in Baltimore is, is shallower. Mm -hmm. So uh, he changed his mind suddenly and said, okay, we're gonna, we have two extra weeks, we're gonna attack Baltimore. And so um, that's when the decision was made. He called back everyone and his, his top leaders had actually tried to convince them to attack Baltimore, so they were thrilled because they wanted to attack Baltimore. So um, I won't go into detail about the battle. I just wanted to tell you about the characters. Um, those are the main six characters. Um, the attack on Baltimore was over a couple days. There was a land, two-pronged attack, sea and land. The sea attack was the battle of, on, on, against Fort McHenry because that was guarding the entrance of the harbor. Um, one of Britain's, one of their top generals was killed during the battle, which was a huge loss for them. But, uh, of course, Francis Guckey was stuck there behind the lines, and throughout the night, and there were several days of bombardment, but the last night it was just constant barrage of, of bombs and rockets. And it was a huge storm going on, so it was pouring rain, thunder, all of it was going on. It was crazy. And, uh, you know, they could see, they could look through their telescope and see if the flag was there at times. But ultimately, they didn't know until the dawn broke whether the flag, whether the Americans held the fort or not. Mm. So um, that's a little bit about the characters. You have to read the book to find out more. But um, it's a fun story. And what interested me most was how the characters were led very, very different lives, but their lives all intersected at this one point. And then they went their own ways. And, um, you know, they all lived their lives after that. And none of them knew that this event would go down in history and become, become so well known in, in our history. Wow. So, anyone have questions? <laughs> Yes. So how many years did it take before we made the Star Spangled Banner our national anthem? So Congress had tried a bunch of times, you know, how long it can take for some, a bill to go through. Um, so eventually, by the early 1900s, the military led the way and had made it kind of their unofficial national anthem. And then I think, I can't remember what year, it's in the book, what year baseball first, it was a World Series, first played it at a baseball game. And um, finally, in 1931, it became the national anthem. So I should say that the, the poem that, well, that's a question, actually, that can be debated, whether he wrote a poem or whether he wrote lyrics. He had a song in mind, so if you have a song in mind and you're writing words, that would imply it's lyrics. Mm. But when it was first published, they didn't say the tune. They just published it as the words, mm -hmm. which is, looks like a poem. So mm -hmm. it's been argued both ways. But he... It was a popular poem, I mean, sorry, a popular song that he had in mind, and it all, he had already written lyrics to that tune before, so it wasn't the first time. But it was well known in, in America because it was a very popular song, tune. So were there, was there competition? Were other people advocating for different things, or they were just taking a long time to make their decision? You mean for the national anthem? Yeah. yeah. No, I don't think there was competition. Everyone had just started using it, the military, and I don't know when the White House first used it. 
I mean, the military bands were supplying the music at the White House, so. Right. Yes. Was Betsy Ross given credit for the flag during her lifetime? That's a good question. I don't know. And did she deny it? But <laughs> Betsy Ross's claim to the flag came through her grandson um, around the time of 1876 was our centennial in Philadelphia. He was living in Philadelphia, and he, he started the whole myth around his grandmother, who was a very savvy marketing person. Oh. And... Um, she was certainly a real person, and there's a document that has Mary Pickersgill's mother and Betsy Ross listed on the same page, mm. which is interesting. I'm, I'm okay. sure they knew each other, because the community of seamstresses was not that big in Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh, do you expect a lot of pushback and anger <laughs> as Betsy Ross is pushed out of her uh, position? I don't know that people are so... Uh, loyal to Betsy Ross <laughs> more than that they just don't know of any other woman in this yeah. time period so she gets you know if the July 4th float she's the woman in the mop cap with the flag over her knee right and it's easier to say but Mary Pickersgill also doesn't fit into the Revolutionary War time period she was born in 1776 so my only beef is that I wish more people knew Mary Pickersgill because her skill involved in sewing the flag. And she was a businesswoman, and there weren't many 18th, 19th century businesswomen. One so. more question. Does that flag still exist? Yes. I'm glad you asked. Oh. It's at the Smithsonian, American Hist National Museum of American History in Washington. Uh, forever on display. That was one of the um, requirements when it was given by the family of the... the, the uh, it, it came to the family of the, the um, head of the fort, the commander of the fort, Fort McHenry. And so it was in his family for many, many years. And they would bring it out for special occasions and hang it up. It's so huge. Wow. Um, and people cut pieces off as souvenirs. So it's much smaller than it was. One star is missing. Um, and eventually he decided that it merited national preservation and it meant something to the country and so he gave it as a as a loan to the Smithsonian and then converted that to a gift several years later. Mm -hmm. Under the stipulation it has to be on display at all times. So when they did the conservation project on it, the ten million dollar conservation project funded by Polo Ralph Lauren, not that long ago, they had the conservation lab on view to the public and so all the time you could go in and see the flag. I'm working on the flag and it was on display. Did anyone see that? No? You missed that. That's cool. Yeah. So. So you mentioned that uh, people associate Betsy Ross, uh, Betsy Ross, with the Revolutionary War. I kind of associated this battle with the Revolutionary War. Yeah. So. Is it, You're not would, the only one. I would think that would be a common misconception yeah. because. No one knows anything about the War of 1812, right? Right. So I assume it was primarily economic things, even though we had won the Revolutionary War, economics, we were still at conflict. It's sometimes called the Second War of Revolution, okay. because this really confirmed that we would be free from Britain. Okay. Um, had Britain won the War of 1812, we could be British again, because yeah. we were such a fragile country. I mean, a lot of the War of 1812 took uh, place on the northern border. Canadian border, right. not down here. And then there was the Battle of New Orleans. If you know that, Andrew Jackson was the hero of that. And, um, and there were some congressmen who wanted to take Canada. So in some ways, this war means a lot to Canadians because it preserved their independence. They weren't one nation. They were different British colonies. But they could have been taken over by the Americans, and we could have Canada now. Yeah, so. yeah. 